Hello, and welcome to the seventh webinar of the Engineering Rising to the Challenge Initiative from Purdue Engineering. Uh, my name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Executive Associate Dean for Faculty and Staff here in the college. Um, now, this initiative began in May 2020 uh, in response to the National Academy of Engineering's call to action uh, for engineers to tackle some of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but our initiative also looks to the longer term future uh, to rethink and re-engineer the very systems that our modern society has come to depend on um, so that they might be more resilient to such shocks in the future while also serving society better. Now, part of the initiative involves webinars where distinguished panelists come together and unpack some of these challenges for us, providing us a glimpse into what the future might look like. And today's panel is about virus transmission and mitigation in buildings, a topic of very timely interest. And it is my honor to introduce the moderator for today's discussion, uh, Panagita Karawa, the J&K Hakama Professor of Civil Engineering. Let me say a few words about um, uh, Professor Karawa. Uh, Dr. Karawa is an expert in smart buildings technology, sustainable energy systems, human building interactions, systems identification and model predictive control of buildings, uh, she's also interested in an expert in socio-technological systems for smart and connected energy aware residential communities. She is a member of the Center for High Performance Buildings here at Purdue, member of the Ray W. Herrick Labs and the Bowen Labs uh, at Purdue. Uh, she has served in many capacities, including in leadership. Uh, she was the Associate Dean uh, of Engineering for Facilities. Uh, and she's been recognized in many ways, uh, including uh, the Roy E. and Myrna G. Wansick Research Excellence Award in the School of Civil Engineering. Uh, she was also awarded the New Investigator Award from the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, over to you, Panagiotou. Thank you very much, Arvind, for the uh, kind introduction. I would like to welcome our uh, panelists, uh, our distinguished panelists, and also uh, the participants of this uh, webinar. I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this um, effort. Um, it's a very timely and significant um, topic. Um, here at Purdue, we have a center dedicated to buildings, the Center for High Performance Buildings, where we conduct uh, research related to energy efficiency, healthy uh, environments, and occupant uh, well being. Um, so, this uh, webinar has been uh, organized in collaboration with the Center for High Performance Buildings, and in particular, uh, the director, Professor. Um, Jim uh, Brown, a professor in mechanical engineering. Um, so we are very uh, devoted to make impact in, in the way we design and operate buildings. And we think that this webinar would be very en enlightening on a topic that is particularly significant as it affects our health and life even, and very timely as well. Uh, without taking uh, more time, I would like to to proceed by um, introducing um, our uh, panelists. Specifically, I will be introducing um, the panelists one by one as they speak. Um, the first paneling, uh, panelist is uh, Professor uh, Jan um, Chen, um, and who is a professor of uh, mechanical engineering, the James uh, Doyer Professor in Mechanical Engineering at Purdue. He has a very distinguished um, career and currently serves as the editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Building and Environment. Um, professor Chen has received uh, numerous uh, awards from uh, various associations. Um, for example, the International Building Performance Simulation Association, uh, he has received the uh, gold, rainbow gold medal for outstanding contributions to the advancement of modeling and measurement of ventilation and air distribution uh, in buildings from the Scandinavian Federation of Heating, Ventilating and Sanitary Engineering. Also, uh, awards from the uh, Institute of Environment Sciences and Technologies. Dr. Chen's research uh, includes uh, indoor environments, aircraft cabin environments, and energy efficient, healthy, and sustainable building design and analysis. Jan, uh, please start with your presentation. 
All right, and uh, thank you very much, um, Panagiota. It's really uh, very kind of you uh, to give this uh, introduction. Let's see, where is my slides? Okay. I hope I could share. Sorry. All right, I find that. Okay, so I hope you could uh, uh, read my slides here. So let's first, I'd like just uh, to give a general overview how this COVID-19 is transmitted in buildings. So according to the US CDC, uh, the transmission route actually is uh, three uh, different routes. The first one is really through the close contact for example, I covered uh, directly or uh, very close to your face. And then those droplet could be in your uh, breathing area, you could inhale or could project directly to your eye, nose area. So it could be absorbed by uh, you uh, through the membrane or skin. Then the second one, uh, now CDC found that it's a very important. This will be the airborne type because uh, a lot of our human activities like coughing, talking, sneezing, uh, et cetera, we produce uh, a lot of uh, uh, small particles. So those particles are pretty small in size, could hang in the air for a long time. So this is really a major concern uh, at this moment. Then the third one, it was uh, a bigger concern. Now uh, CDC actually toned down this a little bit is a format uh, transmission, which means for example, I am now touching my computer keyboard and I leave the computer here and then someone else is, uh, is using uh, my computer just a few minutes later. And then uh, of course um, I leave my uh, virus on the keyboard and then that person uh, could get infected. So I'm going to talk more on the most important one, that's the airborne uh, transmission. So now I just wanted to show you an animation, show a typical coughing, all right? So let's say typical coughing, we cover with a droplet uh, with the size between 0 0.3 micron and up to like a 100, 200 micron in size. And then you can see large uh, particle just drop down due to the gravity. And on the small particles or droplet, you see that with the size about 20 micron or smaller, so they can reach to the other person. So this animation, uh, let me uh, play one more time. It really show the, the distance between two uh, people, right? This distance is about six feet or two meter. And then you can see this small droplet really can travel from one side to the other person. And that's how CDC recommended that we should really uh, keep the social distancing. And of course, this one uh, is just a cough, you don't cover the mouth. However, if you look at our uh, coughing activity, right? This is normally what we'll do. I mean, uh, the, the one on the upper left, this is what you saw in animation. You hardly see this type of cough in the reality. So in most cases, we really try to hide uh, the uh, mouth and nose in certain way. And this is animation by using smoke. You definitely can see with and without the covering can make a huge difference. So this uh, type of study was done long time ago uh, before the COVID-19, but we find this could really uh, play an important role inside our buildings. And here now I just want to show you the, the simulated result. Okay, so the one you saw before was uh, by using smoke. Now, when we use a computer simulation, we can reproduce uh, that type of uh, transmission. So you can see this is one without covering. And if you sit just face to face with another person, then of course, this uh, large crowd of droplet could reach to the other person. But when you cover with your mouth and nose, then you see there's a different uh, cover method then this distance is much smaller. And that's, I think it's very important. And of course, when you use masks, uh, no matter it's just a cloth mask, surgical mask, and the uh, effect will be much better than those by hands or tissues you see in the slides. 
Now, of course, the people will argue when we do the simulation, then could it be garbage in, garbage out, because the computer model is only as good as your assumptions is good. And now I want to show you this is a typical indoor airflow distribution, the air supply from the ceiling written near the floor. And what uh, we calculate using the so called Lagrangian method, this is CFD model, and this is the particle uh, concentration distribution in the room. And we compare our simulation without the, with the measured data. Uh, this was measured by uh, a professor in Japan long time ago. And you can see they are very close. And we also have another different type of method, the so-called Lagrangian method, which means we release the particle just like do the coughing and so on. And then you can uh, tra trace the each particle trajectory. Then you know the history of where this particle coming from, et cetera. Then again, you can uh, calculate the concentration and the uh, little right uh, bottom corner slice shows the concentration. So you can see no matter which model we use, we get a very close result. So that's what I think this uh, method is good. And now I want to show you because with this method, you know, as an HVAC engineer, we could really use it to develop a new type of ventilation system. You know, traditional one I saw, show you just in the slides, uh, last slides, you supply the air in the ceiling and return on the floor, return on the ceiling. Now let's really the one, you know, just like uh, I show here, this is animation. And the, uh, let's say three dimensional view, you probably see like somebody cough there, the particle go everywhere, it's not very clear. So this is a two dimensional one, it's in a classroom, okay? So you see the air supply on this two blue inlet and exhaust in the two green outlets. And of course you can see after a couple of minutes the particle is everywhere. And that's the traditional design of HVAC systems. And now I think we can do a little bit smarter. So we use the so-called displaced induction system. You supply the air in the lower part and then return in the upper part. And when you supply it with the temperature a little bit lower, so the cool air in the, will stay in the floor level and the, your body is warm, so it will uh, generate a thermal prune. Then you will see a little bit of different scenario here. Again, I release the same amount of particle from one of these uh, students in the room. Now, I, uh, because less 3D is not very clear, I like you to look at these 2D animations here. So you see, uh, most of our particles will just stay in the uh, person who releases this droplet and then being exhausted on the ceiling level. So these particles are uh, unlikely, likely uh, mixing ventilation. It doesn't go to very far, but of course, flow, right? It's a very flexible. They always have the diffusion, et cetera. It can, a few could go a little bit further. But generally speaking, you can see the left figure is much cleaner on the right figure. So I think this is something we as a VAC engineer can do. So finally, I will also uh, mention one more slide here. Well, that's okay. Uh, I don't have the time to do that, but I wanted to just say that when you use masks, like a surgical mask, our study show that you can reduce the infection risk by an additional 50%. And now, of course, a lot of new technologies are available to disinfect and clean the air. So if I use this um, uh, bipolar ionizer as an example in this classroom, and our study found that you can reduce the infection risk by an additional 20 to 30%. So let's uh, conclude my little bit of introduction here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chen. And uh, now we will proceed with our second panelist. Um, I would like to inform the audience that we have uh, um, uh, construct uh, the, the webinar in a way that first we're going to introduce the mechanisms of transmission of COVID-19, then we'll talk about mitigation strategies and, and, and uh, design guidelines. So uh, in the first two presentations by Professor Chen and the next by Professor uh, Bohr will cover uh, the first topic. In general, the way this webinar will work, we'll have uh, eight minutes presentations 
uh, by each of the four panelists covering the topics that I mentioned, and then uh, we will um, uh, have a Q&A session. So feel free to submit your questions, and I will be um, uh, presenting those to our panelists. So now we are ready to proceed with our uh, second panelist, Professor um, Brandon Bohr, who is an assistant professor of civil engineering at Purdue. He also has a by courtesy appointment with the Division of Environmental and Ecological Engineering. Um, he conducts research on the physics and chemistry of feed or air. His group applies state of the art measurement techniques to explore the dynamics of indoor air pollutants in diverse indoor environments. Um, he has uh, many accomplishments, among which uh, uh, recently in 2019, he received uh, the National Science Foundation Career um, Award. Uh, Brandon, we're uh, pleased to have you here. So please start with your presentation. Okay, thank you, Professor Caraba. Uh, so today I will be discussing the important and governing role of particle size as it pertains to the transmission and mitigation of COVID-19 in buildings. So the overall aim, I would say, moving forward with the future of buildings is to reduce the number of viral aerosols in indoor air. And to do so, we must consider how the size of these viral aerosols affects their physical transport. So below, you can see an illustration of particle size, we can start with a single viron of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That is about 125 nanometers in size or 0.125 microns. Uh, while that is very small, we know that the virus is transported in indoor air uh, on larger aerosols and droplets. And these can range from a fraction of a micrometer up to tens, uh, 100 plus microns, as you can see here. Uh, in the community, uh, there's different distinctions, whether it's an aerosol or a droplet based on size. Moving forward, I will consider everything that is suspended in the air as a viral aerosol. So to frame mitigation strategies for buildings, we can apply a physics-based material balance model and do that to describe the size-resolved behavior of these viral aerosols. So we can consider their source and loss processes. So a material balance model is illustrated here. This is a simple model considering a single zone reactor. Uh, and what we can do is we can evaluate the accumulation of viral aerosols in a indoor space by looking at the balance between source processes that act to increase the number of viral aerosols indoors and loss processes that act to remove the number of viral aerosols uh, from the air. Uh, so this material balance model um, encapsulates the concentration of the viral aerosols within a well-mixed space that is related to source processes described mathematically through a source rate, so number of particles produced per unit time. And then we subtract off that loss processes. Part of this are loss rates, uh, which are per unit time um, that govern the rate of removal of these particles from the air. So source processes, we can go through a few examples. These are processes that act to release viral aerosols into the air. So the first of which would be respiratory emissions. So this would of course include speaking, uh, breathing, singing, and coughing and sneezing uh, without a mask. If we add on a face mask, that can act to reduce these emissions. So the face mask is not only to protect you, uh, but to reduce the emissions that propagate uh, from your, your mouth and your nose. Another source would be resuspension of dust. So these viral aerosols can settle onto the floor, onto other indoor surfaces, then they can be stirred up and released back into air due to resuspension. Uh, we can also have the flushing of toilets. This can act to release viral aerosols into the air. So all these processes, processes shown here, their emission rates are very much a function of size. So as an example, I can show um, what a curve would look like in an illustrative sense for coughing. So for coughing and other respiratory activities, these emission rates are very much size dependent. And there's a lot of emissions below one micron in size. And these are the smaller particles that can stay in the air for longer periods of time. Some recent research, research has shown that uh, singing produces lots of particles, uh, more so than speaking, which is more so than 
or more than what you would have for just breathing. But all respiratory activities will release some amount of viral aerosols into the air. And looking at loss processes, uh, we can consider where do these viral aerosols end up within a building? So the first process we have that's very important for these larger particles above a micron is deposition to indoor surfaces, to flooring, to furniture. Um, and for larger particles, this is primarily governed by gravitational settling. Smaller particles diffusion um, is important. Then we have removal via filtration uh, systems within HVAC systems. So we have various types of filter media that can be used to remove these particles from the air. We have removal via portable air cleaners that can use uh, fiber-based uh, filter media. We have removal via the face mask uh, on people that are exposed to the viral aerosols. And then we have removal via outdoor air ventilation. And this is something that is not size dependent, but still incredibly important for buildings. And looking at the size dependency of some of these loss processes, uh, looking at deposition to surfaces and the deposition rate, uh, this is a very strong function of size. This deposition rate tends to increase the particle size from about a micron to 10 microns. Um, it's dependent on the surface type, its orientation, airflow conditions, and for particles above about three microns, it can be a very important process governing the residence time of viral aerosols in buildings. Then we have filtration mechanisms. This is pertinent to uh, HVAC filter media, filter media and portable air cleaners, as well as face masks. Uh, and this is strongly size dependent. And we see that for particles above a micron, efficiencies tends to increase, but there's generally a minimum uh, between 0.1 and 1 microns. So this filtration efficiency tends to have a U-shaped curve. So these smaller particles below micron, which our respiratory activities produce an abundance of, are the most challenging to remove with different types of filter media. Along with these source and loss processes in buildings, particle size is very important in governing the fate of those particles once they're inhaled into our respiratory systems. So in looking at where viral aerosols end up in the lung, uh, as we breathe in air, first they will, some of those particles will deposit in the head airway, so our nose and nasal cavity and our throat. Uh, some will be transported to deeper regions of our lung, including the tracheal bronchial region. And then finally to the pulmonary region, and this is where gas exchange takes place. So this process of lung deposition is very much dependent on size. Here you can see an example of a lung deposition fraction curve uh, for each region of the lung plus the total. And we see that a lot of particles are deposited very efficiently uh, in all three regions of the lung across the size range of relevance to viral aerosols. And I'd like you, like you to note that we do see a lot of deposition for particles in the tracheobronchial and pulmonary regions uh, between just one and 10 microns. So these particles get to the deepest regions of our lungs. So in summary, you know, in terms of working towards buildings that protect us from virus exposure, uh, we can use mathematical modeling and aerosol physics to describe the source and loss processes of these particles, as well as, as, well as exposure and lung deposition. So in looking at this, we want to minimize the source rates and we want to increase uh, the loss rates. So we want to reduce emissions, the number of people that are in a space producing these particles, we want people to wear face masks to capture some of these emissions. And then we want to use various types of filter media to remove these particles efficiently from the air, um, as well as increase outdoor air ventilation. Uh, so I think this framework is incredibly useful and should guide our mitigation uh, practices in buildings moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bohr. And now we're moving on uh, with our next um, speaker and we're moving on on a slightly different topic. Uh, we covered um, the basics of um, virus transmission in buildings. Now we will start talking about short-term mitigation um, strategies um, to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have um, the best um, uh, panelists we could hope for for this. Uh, this is Professor William Banfleth uh, from uh, Architectural Engineering at Penn State University. I'm saying he's the best we could hope for for this topic because he actually served 
as the president of the American Society of Heating, Refrigerating and Air Conditioning Engineers in 2013-2014. So he has been heavily involved in, in the society and uh, in uh, standards uh, development. Uh, he has been recognized for his uh, work uh, in ASHRAE uh, through numerous uh, awards, including the Louis and Bill Holiday Distinguished Fellow Award and um, uh, the E.K. Campbell Award and the Paul Anderson Award. His research interests cover a wide range of variety of indoor environment control topics, um, including uh, protection of building occupants from indoor aerosol releases and ultraviolet gamicidal irradiation um, systems. Uh, Professor uh, Bantlet, um, we look forward to your presentation. I've uh... I forgot to unmute myself. Very glad to be with you all. And uh, I was going to say that while I'm a researcher uh, in, in various related areas in, uh, in professional life, I've done a lot of work with ASHRAE. And I'm here really to talk about what ASHRAE has recommended as guidance for HVAC systems in buildings. And I won't be able to cover all of that in the, the short time that we have here, but I'll, I'll hit the, uh, the high points and we can address other things in Q&A. So ASHRAE, uh, very briefly, is, is a, the, the main technical society for the HVAC in our profession in, uh, in North America and also uh, a worldwide organization, so 55,000 members in 130 plus countries. And uh, it's an organization that writes the standards for indoor air quality in buildings and, and other things as well that are used uh, particularly throughout uh, the US and, and North America, but also referenced in other places. And uh, back in March, I was asked to lead uh, an ASHRAE task force addressing COVID-19. We call it the epidemic task force because we're addressing the, uh, the issues of infectious disease transmission in buildings more broadly. And I'll uh, point here to uh, the website, ashrae.org slash COVID-19, where you can find the guidance that's been posted so far and also a lot of other related resources that uh, will expand on what I'm covering here. Uh, Professor Chen mentioned uh, the modes of, of transmission. And of course, if you have followed this, you know that there's been a great deal of uh, controversy uh, between public health organizations, WHO, CDC, and other uh, scientific and, and professional groups, aerosol scientists and uh, and engineers about whether uh, airborne transmission occurs at all. Uh, but ASHRAE and other HVAC organizations really adopted what we call a precautionary principle at the outset and have been assuming that controlling airborne exposure is important. So all of the things I'm talking about here uh, relate to controlling airborne transmission because that's really all we can do with HVAC systems. But so now recently, since uh, beginning of October, we at least have from CDC and WHO uh, some recognition that under some circumstances, uh, airborne transmission can occur in closed spaces, prolonged exposure to uh, respiratory particles, and also inadequate ventilation and air handling. So there's, there is a recognition that uh, HVAC systems have a role to play, both transmitting and controlling COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. So uh, let's talk about the uh, main elements of, of guidance that uh, are being applied by ASHRAE. We have over 400 pages of, of guidance documents now, but really you can put the, the essentials of it on uh, one or two slides. The, the first one is follow public health guidance, meaning wear masks and practice distancing and use hygiene. And in no way does protecting yourself from airborne transmission uh, by making modifications to your HVAC systems um, give you a, a justification to not practice these other controls for different modes of transmission and in particular uh, close range. Uh, many may have seen this image on the left from uh, Lydia Bruiba at uh, MIT that shows an uncontrolled sneeze moving uh, almost eight meters away from person. And uh, another image on the right shows how effective a, 
cloth mask can be at uh, stopping that respiratory jet and also probably removing as much as 50% of the, uh, the infectious material. So if we wanna do that, now what do we do with HVAC systems? Um, we should provide at least the amount of outdoor air that's required by minimum standards. This is essential for controlling all sorts of indoor uh, air contaminants. It's also a, a good baseline, although not sufficient for controlling uh, infection risk. As far as air distribution uh, is concerned, avoiding strong currents that are going to extend close uh, contact uh, transmission is important. And so to, to ventilation, we need to add filters that actually work on those small particles that Dr. Bohr was talking about. So we upgrade from uh, low MERV ratings, the ASHRAE standard 52.2 system, MERV 6 or 8, to MERV 13, or equivalently ISO EPM1, which uh, will control the, the micron and submicron particles. And, and we can enhance that further with air disinfection technologies, uh, ultraviolet and, and others that are available. But this slide shows why it's important to use different filters. I'm showing here one of the uh, most widely uh, distributed uh, images of uh, respiratory droplet uh, size spectrum. And uh, most of them, as were noted, that are of concern are smaller than 10 microns. And actually a lot of them are, are smaller than that. And I've overlaid on it the three ranges within which uh, the, the ASHRAE standard 52.2 rates a, a filter. So let's just look at MERV 8, um, which has no requirement at all to remove particles that are smaller than one micron, 20% for one to three microns, and 70% for three to 10. That's really not going to help us very much if we're trying to reduce infection risk. But if we go to the level of MERV 13, that's recommended. We now have a filter that will remove 50% at least from 0.3 to 1, 85% from 1 to 3, and 90 from 3 to 10. Uh, it's important as we think about strategies for risk uh, management to think about how to put together different controls. We can have more outdoor air. We can put in very high efficiency filters. There's probably a balance between them. Uh, so combining them in the most effective way is important. Uh, ventilations expensive and affects operations. And as uh, some work by uh, Brett Stevens and his student Azimi at Illinois Institute of Technology showed, at least for looking at, at influenza, improving filter efficiency can get us to the same level of relative risk as ventilation at a much lower cost. So that tends to be preferred as the first thing you do to enhance beyond what minimum standards would uh, have you do. Uh, for HVAC operations, uh, we can talk a lot about humidity in the discussion, but uh, there is some reason to believe that controlling humidity, particularly at the low end of the scale to 30 or 40 percent, has some protective uh, uh, value. Systems should always be operated when people are present. Don't shut them off just because it's the end of the business day. And don't use things like demand-controlled ventilation to save energy uh, when that's going to uh, reduce the amount of ventilation. And uh, also importantly, uh, do things that will reduce the amount of recirculation. And this is a, an important point because initially we were saying, or some were saying, shut off energy recovery wheels. So you, you can't operate them safely, but they have to be evaluated. And then uh, a, a final point here, commissioning of systems is really important that we could have a whole webinar just on, on how badly most HVAC systems work. But uh, schools are a big uh, point of discussion right now. And not that long ago, the, the GAO published a report on K-12 schools that found that over 40% of school districts had 50% or more of their HVAC systems that either needed to be replaced or repaired. And they also had significant problems with windows and with monitoring of indoor air quality. So um, there's a, an important uh, need to evaluate systems here. So that is, is in a nutshell, the main points of, of this guidance and other things we can pick up in the question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Banfleth. A very enlightening talk and uh, it's scary to see how badly building operates. I hope we can uh, take them more seriously in uh, the future. Uh, we will move on with our uh, 
uh, towards our next topic um, that includes mitigation strategies, but also their impact on um, um, on energy use, operation of buildings, and in general, virus-proof designs and strategies for buildings. Our next uh, distinguished uh, speaker is John Douglas. Uh, he's the director of advanced development for the global control groups, uh, global controls group at Johnson Controls. He currently leads uh, Johnson Controls building infection control WG technical team tasked with developing solutions to mitigate COVID infection risk in buildings. Um, so he's very qualified to be on this panel and we're very excited to have him. Uh, we should proudly say that he's a Purdue alumni. He graduated with his bachelor's and, and master's degree um, at Purdue. And he has 25 years of uh, experience in HVAC and R industry, 34 patents uh, issued, and he's well known. Uh, he has a very good reputation as an innovator, um, start er with experience ranging from small technology startups to large Fortune 500 um, companies. So uh, without further ado, I would like to warmly welcome uh, John Douglas uh, on this uh, panel, and um, I look forward to his presentation. Thank you, Panagiotto. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to present here. I, I'm looking for learned already quite a bit um, from the previous presenters. And I'm um, on my talk here today, what I'm going to do is take a lot of the science that's been presented earlier and, and share with you a method that we've used to, to put that science together um, and help our customers quantify the benefits associated with um, infection control measures as they're applied to buildings. This first slide, I think we've covered this quite a bit. There's three modes of infection. HVAC solutions tend to affect primarily the aerosol mode of infection. And I just like this picture because I think when we think about aerosol infection, we need to think about a smoke-filled room. And so think of everyone as a potential smoker and we're all generating smoke. And as if you don't do anything, that smoke slowly builds up in the room and eventually you're gonna breathe some smoke in. So, so just kind of think about, when you think of aerosol infection, think about that smoke-filled room analogy. So first thing I wanna talk about are the different air cleaning methods. And, and so if you think about air cleaning, we can break them down into three basic methods. The first one is ventilation, where you basically dilute the pollutants in the air with fresh, clean air from outside. Filtration, where we mechanically remove the particles in the air and take them out. Or disinfection, where we actually deactivate the bacteria and viruses in the air. And if you look at these, they each have a different effect on the different pollutants in the air. Ventilation tends to be preferred in a lot of the ASHRAE standards because by the nature of it diluting, it actually addresses all the pollutants in the air. It takes care of dust, chemicals in the air, the bat biological gases in the bathroom, and the viruses and bacteria. Um, the good thing is, in the context of COVID and particles that contain COVID viruses, all three of these air cleaning technologies can be useful tools in our toolbox to address it. So we can use all three to address COVID. So this next slide, what I want to do is talk about the concept of clean air delivery rate. So clean air delivery rate is a measure of the amount of removal of virus containing particles you can do in the air. And the way we calculate clean air delivery rate, it's you take the airflow through the device times the removal efficiency. And, and let me give you a couple examples. Um, on, on, the, on the upper left-hand side over here, we have a portable room air cleaner. It, is, um, it moves about three, this one moves 324 CFM of airflow. It has a HEPA filter in it, so it's 99.9% .9 efficient at COVID sized particles. And so if you multiply the two together, you get about 324 CFM of clean air delivered to the space. You can kind of compare that to ventilation. This is a rooftop unit. Um, this one's set up, we've got 30% outside air. In the context of COVID and COVID laden particles, we're going to assume that the outside air is 100% COVID free, so 100% clean air. So if you take that 30% outside air times the 1200 CFM of a three ton rooftop unit, you get about 400 CFM of clean air coming from that ventilation system. And then there's just another example where you can take a MERV-7 filter, roughly 42% efficient, not super efficient, but because it's moving a ton of air, it still actually does some air cleaning. So you get some airflow rate in cleaning from that, that unit. You get 504 CFM of clean air. The cool thing about this, the good thing about this is this is a means of quantifying the air cleaning rate of different types of, um, 
IEQ mitigation measures. So we have a, one common measure to, to put them all together. So the next slide, um, I'm gonna introduce the Wells-Riley model. So this is a model that's been used by um, scientists um, to, to quantify the risk of infection um, due to, due to um, aerosol infection. And um, it's been used, it actually the first paper was published in, in 1978, and it's been used um, to, to quantify the risk of infection of, of influenza, TB, measles, um, et cetera. Um, the, the, the equation um, assumes that the air in the room is perfectly mixed. So it's a little bit different than what Dr. Chen is doing where you're actually modeling the specific details of the particles um, flowing through the room. We're actually assuming that the particles that you breathe out are all perfectly mixed up and we're calculating the concentration. And so when you, you take this equation, there's a lot of parameters here, but when you plot it in the most basic form, you get a, a risk curve that looks like the plot we have here. And so the vertical axis is, is a measure of the risk of infection. And, um, and then the horizontal axis, what I plotted is the clean air delivered to the space. So what you can see from this curve is that as you increase the amount of clean air delivered to the space, your risk of infection goes down pretty quickly. And then as you get further out to clean air del delivered, um, the risk, um, oops, the risk goes out. So, so, um, and I forgot to mention this bottom axis, the clean air axis here is air changes per hour. So we're talking about four air changes per hour or 10 air changes per hour. When you look at this equation, the parameters that are in this equation can, can be divided up into three logical groups. I kind of call them the COVID science, um, building operation and clean air delivered. The COVID science, there's a term here, Q, um, which is, is the quanta infection rate and quanta generation rate. And that's really a measure of the degree of infectiveness the virus is. And, and the way that number is calculated is you actually back calculate it out by looking at actual case studies of, of infections and then back it out. Because COVID's so new, we're still learning. And so th there's a lot of variation in this Q value. And so I put these error bars on to kind of show that we're still really learning the, the, how to build the relationship between the risk um, and, and the air delivered. So there, there's kind of a, a pretty significant error bar. But the good thing is, is that there's still a consistent trend, which is as you increase the clean air delivered, you reduce the risk of infection. So the next group of parameters are building operation. I'm gonna to go to the next slide to talk about that. So, so key parameters in building operation are, are how many people in your building are infected, what is the activity level, how much time is in the space, right? And then mask usage. And so, so I built this plot over here to kind of illustrate that. And this is, this is modeled based on a, a classroom. And I modeled typical measures that classrooms would do to, to mitigate risk. So um, this orange line is the baseline case, um, nothing done. Kids are going to school, normal occupancy, normal behavior. And then if, if we modeled masks, we've talked about masks as being, um, they basically reduce the amount of um, virus particles generated by about 50%. We put that in the model and you can see that the, the risk of infection drops quite a bit. Actually, the risk drops by more than a factor of two. I mean, you can see it goes from 1.1 down to, to less than a half at four clean air changes per hour. So masks are really, really important. The next thing I said is some schools have gone to a case where they have some students in school and some students at home. So they're running at a 50% occupancy. So by reducing the occupant density, you can see we further reduce the risk curve. And so we're going down to a lower curve here. And then the other thing that schools have done is they've gone to a half day. So they've reduced the exposure time from the normal seven hours to three and a half hours. And you can see that would further reduce the risk curve. So, so a way to think about this is how you run your building determines which of these curves you're on. And then how you run your HVAC determines where you are along the curve. So, so um, for the rest of the slides, I'm gonna assume that best practices is at least wearing masks. So we're gonna use this blue curve for the rest of the slides. The next slide goes into showing how the, the typical HVAC measures influence um, the risk of infection. So what I did was I took, the first thing you always wanna do is do your ASHRAE 62.1 required ventilation. So in this space, um, the ASHRAE ventilation gives you about two and a half clean air changes per hour. So I added that in and you can see it's, we, we took our risk from one all the way down to about 0.45. Then the other, other recommendations, as, as Bill mentioned, is, is, is a MERV-13 filter. So we added in the clean air delivered per the MERV-13 filter. And you can see that that takes a risk down from about 0.45 to like 0.28. And so you can see there's quite a bit of risk reduction associated with just applying the standard 62.1 ventilation in MERV-13. On this chart, you can see that the curve stops at six. And the reason I did that is, is that this system 
only deliver six air changes per hour. So the best we can actually do with a centralized HVAC system would be 100% clean air, which would be six air changes per hour. If we want to reduce the risk further by going down this line, we need to add a source of clean air. Now, the reason, an important thing to get here is, is that the amount of risk reduction delivered by the HVAC system is a function of the, the airflow delivered by the HVAC system. So in this next slide, I want to illustrate what happens when you have a variable air volume system and it runs at this lowest airflow. So variable air volume systems vary the airflow rate based on load. It's designed to save energy. And so in this case, the VAV system is at a low load and it's reduced its airflow rate. We still get the benefit of the ASHRAE ventilation because the outdoor air dampers are gonna to adjust to maintain a constant ventilation rate because the occupancy is constant. But because the airflow rate is lower, we don't get that much benefit from the MERV-13 filter. So, so again, the benefit is, is, is a function of load. So what can we do about it? What we can do is add another source of clean air. And so what, what we do is in zone, in zone filtration. So this box shows the benefit of a 600 CFM. It, it gives you about um, two and a half air changes per hour fan filter unit. And so this end zone filter makes up for the difference of the reduced airflow rate from the centralized HVAC system and gets our clean air, to your, our infection risk back down to the same levels we had with the full airflow of the full design HVAC system. So once you've got all this in place, right, it's important to think about um, what you do after you install your equipment. So it's important to really think about monitoring. And, and the reason I say that is, is that when you think about building operations and, and, and HVAC systems are primarily designed for comfort, we actually have natural fault detection for, for buildings, right? If, if your HVAC stops working, people get hot or cold and they start complaining. Um, the maintenance is notified and somebody goes and fixes it. Um, also, we've got a lot of focus on energy efficiency. So, so most large building automation systems, even most medium-sized building automation systems have energy monitoring. So there are alarms out there that tell you you're consuming too much energy. There's not really any way that people can tell that they're getting poor IQ or that the building automation systems really know that you're getting poor IQ. So there's a need as we move forward to provide monitoring systems in which we're actually monitoring the clean air delivered by these systems. And so, so this is just an example of, of a, a chart that we have. Where we're actually measuring the amount of clean air delivered to the space and comparing it to, to the alarm level. And, and this plot is showing that we're actually delivering the, at least the minimum amount of clean air um, for this space. And then the last slide, um, we, we wanted to talk about the, the future of buildings. How, do, how does um, this outbreak affect future buildings? And so the way I'd like to frame it is to think about it from a time scale. So if you look at natural disasters, I've got a picture of the COVID virus. We've had talks of wildfires in California and Canada. Um, hurricanes, right? They generally happen on a short time scale, really fast. Then over here, you have the, the time scale of buildings, right? It, it takes a while to, to design and build a building. You've got to go through the design cycle. The construction cycle is pretty long. And then the other thing to think about is, is I've got a picture of a new building here compared to an old building. Buildings tend to last a long time, right? So, so the, build, the building life cycle is pretty much a long time scale. So how do we put these two together? And my feeling is, is, is the key word is flexibility. So as we think about designing and operating buildings, we need to design flexibility in such that we can adapt to these natural disasters. COVID will be here, it'll be gone hopefully soon, um, but we need to design our buildings um, to be prepared for the next disaster so that we can quickly adapt. I think that's the last slide, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Very inspiring talk and very interesting uh, ending slide. Uh, so we have a lot of questions from our audience. It's very exciting. I have been monitoring and it's a very, very dynamic uh, audience. So I will uh, start uh, asking in somewhat uh, random order uh, a question that uh, relates to the latest um, discussion about future design of buildings um, uh, is uh, related to can we change the architectural design of buildings to make them more um, um, uh, resilient to uh, to the exposure to COVID-19? So architecturally, can, what can we do um, to uh, make the buildings more uh, strong? Maybe um, John or um, Bill can, can take this uh, question. 
Uh, well, sure, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at it. I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer in our architectural engineering department. I want to make that clear. Uh, but you know, I think architecturally things that can be done would help to uh, uh, make it possible to keep people uh, separated during normal activities. I think a lot of buildings, we discover that they actually have pinch points in it that make distancing hard to, uh, uh, to practice. And uh, there's certainly work being done on low transfer surfaces. So if there's concern about fomite transfer, we can, can have surfaces are gonna be less likely to transfer. And another very important thing is, is uh, no touch uh, technology. So uh, you use your phone to call the elevator. You don't have to touch a door to go into the restroom. So those are a, a few things that come to mind that are on the architectural side. Great, thank you, uh, Bill. Um, I'll uh, continue with uh, another question, um, mostly on the practical side of things. I think John can take this. There was a question about your uh, talk, John. Uh, how about the combined effect if you wear a mask and 50% occupancy and half day operation? Have you looked at those combinations? Yeah, oh, just to be clear, um, that was the combined. I was adding them on. So, so okay, this is what I thought, but uh, yeah. I wanted to, to double check and, and clarify. Um, excellent. Um, there are a lot of questions for all the, uh, the um, uh, panelists. Um, so there is a question about um, uh, Professor Chen, how feasible would be to run safety model for the major classrooms on, on campus and have room specific information on, on ventilation geometry and settings in these uh, rooms? Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. I think uh, typically if you look at some uh, auditoriums, we might house like a 200 or 300 seats. Right, so uh, to simulate this type of classroom, say it's not uh, uh, very easy because you probably need about 20, 30 million uh, grid. So that's uh, the reality. You need a, uh, a reasonable size of computer in order to do the job. But in, in addition to that, because uh, for classrooms, we have very complex uh, uh, air diffusers. And that uh, normally when we run the CFD, we just assume there's a hole there, but in fact, it's not a hole. So that's already some technologies available there. And I think this really is a very challenging aspect of a CFD simulation. But with the development in the past 20 years, I think there are a number of things that are already available. So if you have a computer cluster, then you can just run a node and will be sufficient to simulate a classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I'm sure you can do it all with the experience that you have <laughs> in, in record time. Uh, the other question is related to filtration. Maybe I'll have uh, Brandon uh, answer this question. Some people claim that many building owners, due to fund capacity, they cannot use high filter efficiencies. So what do you think? Um, uh, do you think that higher filtration um, is not worth the reduced airflow? Uh, thank you for that question. So I think John touched on this nicely. It's a balance between both the efficiency of the filter, the size is all efficiency, and the flow rate of air moving through that filter. Um, so I, I think that if you are constrained by the blower that you have and just can't handle the pressure drop of a you know, really high efficient, high, High efficient MERV 16 filter, you know, then you will have some issues there because if the blower is struggling, the flow rate will be decreased depending on a particular blower design. Others can adjust the uh, flow rate based on the pressure drop. But I think that's a balance that we need to, you know, think about, you know, the blower capacity and also the energy consumption of that blower, especially if something like a VFD blower, if it's working harder to provide more air for a given pressure drop, you know, you're gonna consume more energy. But that being said, you know, I think that we have other factors to consider now beyond just energy consumption of the blower. I think another thing that could be done, especially in residential environments and maybe dormitories and other shared spaces is using portable air cleaners, uh, which John touched on with you know, that have high clean air delivery rates, I think those are quite effective because they can be placed in the occupied space. So if the blower is not able to handle something like a HEPA filter, 
but you can purchase a portable air cleaner from Home Depot or Walmart that does have a HEPA filter, put it in the occupied space. I think that could be a nice addition and something that should be considered. Can I add Thank you. Yes, so, so, please. Um, yeah. So, so I think that a lot of people have the perception that MERV 13 filters have a high pressure drop. And in, in the data that I've seen, it's not as high as you think. Um, we have a filter division. I've looked at our filtration data. And for the same filter, it was, I think it was a two inch filter. Um, a MERV 8 filter was 0.12 inches of static pressure drop. The same size filter at the same airflow rate, it was 0.19 for MERV 13. So, so in, in the context of a system that probably has a total of a one inch static pressure drop, it's really not that much of an increase in pressure drop. So, so take a look at the filters you're looking at. It, it, a lot of times the pre added pressure drop isn't as much as you think. I've got a couple of, of, of add-ons there as well. Um, going in backwards here they, with uh, filters, it, it's true. There's probably more variability across a, a particular MERV rating than there is between one and the next, but those two inch filters get to MERV 13 because they're electrostatically charged and the charge can wear off very quickly. There's another rating called MERV A that conditions the filter to take away the electrostatic effect. And uh, that filter is going to hold its performance, but you probably need a four inch filter or a bag filter to, to do it. Uh, the, the issue or the concept of uh, supplementing central filtration with portables was, was covered. I want to mention one other thing though. If you have a de dedicated outdoor air system, and let's say you have radiant panels as the, the conditioning equipment in the space, you have no filtration for particles in that space. You get whatever you get from the ventilation because the filter in your DOAS air handling unit only filters the outside air. So you, you have to, in those cases, rely on something in the space, whether it's a portable you add, or if you've got fan coils or VRF cassettes or uh, something of that sort, uh, that's going to be your, your source of particulate removal in the, in the space to get beyond whatever your air changes of ventilation are. Thank you all very much. A related question, uh, since it's a mitigation strategy, I will have a question about uh, how do you see the role of upper room air UVG as a part of a permanent strategy associated with some of others, for example, uh, protective equipment, surface disinfection, ventilation, and remote work. Uh, I think, Bill, you may have some experience with um, this technology. Sure. Well, you know, upper room UV was, was first tested in the 1930s against measles outbreaks in schools in Philadelphia and worked very well. It's a fairly expensive um, technology. It might be equipment might cost three to five dollars a square foot, and then you've got to install it. So I think once you've put it in, you're, you're going to use it. Uh, and it's tremendously effective. Systems that are properly installed have been uh, measured to have equivalent uh, air change rates of, of 10 air changes and, and up, even to, to close to 100. So uh, it's very effective. The question is, uh, is it right for every space? No, because it's very expensive. So we'd put it into places where uh, it would likely be having a, a beneficial effect uh, all the time. There are other less expensive ways to use UV, like putting it in your air handling unit, which is less than a dollar a square foot uh, installed, but, but less, uh, less uh, air change effectiveness. Okay, thank you very much. Very insightful answer. Um, and um, I will move on, change the topic uh, a little bit. Um, so, what does the research show for the existence of the virus in an enclosed environment once a known infection has been present? Do, do, do we have any data or any information related to this? Any of the panelists can, can take this question. Um, so how yeah. long does it Could stay? Just, yes. Sorry. Could I just jump in? Of course, yeah, please. I, I did a lot of research in the airplanes, right? The airplanes uh, yeah, is an enclosed environment, just like the buildings, and the airplanes use HEPA filters. And recently, DOD also conducted a very good study together with the uh, uh, United Air, and they found that, uh, yes, uh, definitely uh, HEPA filters work very fine. And if somebody was coughing, talking, and sneezing, will have some impact in the same role because the airflow pattern 
in the airplane is really going like that. So in the same cross section, you already have a high uh, invasion rate. And there's a number of flights already uh, demonstrated the risk is there. For example, uh, on March the 2nd, Benang Air from London to Hanoi, one person invited 12. And recently, uh, also in March, there was another flight from Boston to Hong Kong. And then uh, two uh, COVID uh, passengers invited uh, two flight attendants. So those are just a few cases that demonstrate that there's um, uh, infection risk is there because they use the RNA uh, technology. So they can uh, identify the same string of a virus. But on the other hand, a number of other flights that show no infection at all. And we did a little bit of analysis. We find that if you, you, uh, every passenger wear masks, then the uh, risk becomes very, very low. We find that uh, there's uh, a flight from Singapore to Hangzhou in uh, February. And that's uh, a uh, Airbus flight with more than 300 people and only one get infected. And that person get infected because uh, uh, that person lowered the mask uh, for one hour during this uh, uh, three and a half hours of flight. And although in the plane there was more than 15 confirmed COVID-19 patient. So wearing mask is a huge difference in this enclosed space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. I think one distinct difference between planes and buildings is that buildings are uniquely designed. And here is a nice question um, related to building design. So how do spaces like cubicle, uh, cubicles compared to new open plan office areas uh, for the resistance to spread of aerosols. Uh, so how we, do, we were talking earlier about how we configure buildings. For example, if we have really small cubicles compared to open areas, how would that affect uh, the spread of the virus? Um, I think uh, Jan, you might be able to take this question as well. Yes, I mean, uh, cubicles, and. Um... Uh, it depends on what type of ventilation systems you have, right? If you design like modern buildings with the underfloor air distribution, so then the uh, cubicle is very good because you supply the air underfloor and then go one dimension up to the ceiling level. That's very good. But when you look at the um, traditional mixing ventilation, then the air flow doesn't go to very deep in the cubicles, especially um, when you have at least um, uh, cubicles with a little bit of higher partition walls. And uh, according to our past study, we find that the air is uh, more or less uh, under stagnation. And which means the particle will not easily move it out. That's a good thing or bad thing. Good thing, if you stay in the neighboring uh, cubicles, probably you don't get a lot of uh, particles right away. But on the other hand, it accumulates in such a way and then eventually particle will go out. So you will be subject to the uh, infection. Thank you. Yeah, and, and an example to think about is um, our school district when they first opened schools was talking about putting plastic walls around the kids' desks, right? And if you think about it, imagine, it's kind of weird to think about a kid smoking, but imagine somebody sitting behind a desk behind an acrylic divider smoking a cigarette, right? That first puff, this, the acrylic does a decent job of keeping that from blowing in your face, but over time, that smoke builds up in the room, and 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 if, and you start smelling smoke. So so I think that that kind of work is a way to think about it in terms of the layout of building cubicles and things like that. Having a cubicle wall short term right probably blocks the the immediate discharge and the larger particles. But over time, those smaller aerosol particles fill up the room if you don't have other mitigation measures. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, there are several questions in the chat about the bipolar ionization as a measure um, to reduce um, virus transmission. And any thoughts from any uh, of, of the panelists, um, perhaps Bill or uh, anybody? Sure. Well, I mean, we, we've seen the claims about uh, how effective bipolar ionization is, and, and you can get uh, research reports from some of the manufacturers. And uh, certainly it seems that ions have an effect on, on uh, removing viruses and other pathogens from the air and, and from surfaces. The, the question is how effectively do they do it compared to, to other things that you might do like filtration and, and UV and, and more ventilation. And Sometimes, you know, there, there are all sorts of manufacturers. When you look at some of those studies carefully, the application 
conditions are pretty different than than the conditions and the tests and the the literature on what happens when you put anything reactive into the air is not as conclusive as as we wish it would so it would be so I, I think that uh, some are using it and they're they're finding that it's effective but there are many who have questions they'd like to have answered before we put lots of ions or hydrogen peroxide gas or hydroxyl radicals or other things into the air that, that are already there. Thank you, Bill. Um, a question, um, um, interesting, it makes me think, um, can we use a CO2 sensor as a proxy of the in infection in the room? Um, um, maybe I'll, I'll I can ask one. Brandon, oh yeah, John or Brandon. Yeah, yeah, I think CO2 is a good measure of the number of people in a space relative to the ventilation rate. That, that, that's, that's really what it's good for. Um, you know, so if you assume everybody's sick, right, then it is a good measure of, of um, uh, you know, the amount of COVID in the air. But, it, but again, all of us breathe out CO2. Um, it's diluted by ventilation air. And so you, if you do all the math, it sort of ends up that CO2 levels are sort of a good measure of number of people in the space divided by the ventilation rate. You know, maybe it's getting a little, a little academic, but there's a really interesting paper by Rudnick and Milton, uh, Don Milton now at, at Maryland, where they, they actually use the CO2 concentration in the air uh, as a surrogate for how much infected air someone was breathing from an infected person. They embedded that in the Wells-Riley equation that you were talking mm -hmm. about and showed that there was, was maybe some usefulness for that. Okay, good to know. Very interesting. Um, another question, um, a little timely since we enter uh, winter. Um, I think I'll have Brandon uh, take a first uh, pass on this. Um, so uh, what would the mask effect be if it's winter and people are coming back from outside with running nose? And since large droplets fall on floor, how is the re-entrainment model? So uh, maybe the second part is re related to Jan's model, but here a uh, model could also be some of the things that uh, Brandon has talked about. Um, Brandon, would you like to comment on this? I'm not so sure about the impact of, of the season per se on the effectiveness on the face mask. I, I think the, the running nose, so you may nose. have a running, yeah. Uh, that I'm not quite sure about. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I would like to point out with face mask and also HVAC filtration, which we were discussing earlier, the efficacy of either mitigation technique will be dependent on bypass. So I think with face mask, you know, whether it's winter or summer, uh, especially surgical mask and other, you know, improperly fitted, you know, fabric based masks that people are wearing nowadays, there could be a rather significant bypass. And, you know, sometimes you can see that if you feel kind of air passing up across your eyes. And the same thing with a filter in the HVAC system, if it's not properly installed, there could be a lot of bypass. So that bypass is a significant issue because there's no filtration occurring either on the exhalation with the face mask or the inhalation. Uh, so I think making sure that the face mask is properly fitted to the face is something that we, we need to uh, factor in. Humidity can play a role in uh, filtration efficiency and the pressure drop of the filter. So that's something that can vary seasonally. Um, but I think the bypass is something that needs to be uh, seriously thought of. If it's just on your face and there's a lot of bypass, it's not going to be so effective. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so there is... Um, a question for Dr. Chen. Is there a good way to correlate the virus concentration distribution from the CFD results to COVID-19 infection risk? Yeah, that's a, a very good question. I think John just showed that if you want to do the correlation, you can use a well-rated equation. But on the other hand, they are not exactly the same because CFD, you really calculate the local concentration and well-rated equation just based on well-mixing condition. So you need to do a little bit of collaborations there. And even you look at the quantum number released by a patient, the well ready equation also give you a very wide range of the quantum number. So that's why I think it's very difficult to give you a quantitative uh, uh, answer on this one, but uh, definitely there's a correlation there. So we definitely in the academic field, we use a well ready equation 
under this uh, non-uniform concentration, and we still can give you a risk estimate, for example, 10, 15%. But uh, how good is the model? As I mentioned, that's uh, the assumptions we have used. Yeah, I think one, one place you can look for uh, uh, guidance on, on air change rates is healthcare standards, you know, in, independent of uh, disease and, and our ability to do risk calculations for, for COVID-19, you can look at the air change rates and the filter efficiencies that are used in say ASHRAE standard 170 that's used for, for healthcare. And actually it puts you in about the same place. It looks like about six total air changes up to maybe as many as, as 12 or 20, depending on whether it's a really uh, critical space. And they're using filters that are typically uh, MERV 14 for the, the ones that aren't really critical and, and HEPA filters in operating rooms and uh, protective environments and isolation rooms. So six air changes with uh, MERV 14 filters, not a, uh, a bad place to start because that's what they're already doing. And the, the only kind of facility we have that's designed to prevent infections. Great, thank you very much. I think there is a whole uh, discussion here about um, models and, and how we can trust them. Um, I know B Brandon is, uh, there are many questions in the, in the chat and uh, in the q and I'm going to lump them together and maybe ask Brandon to take a first pass who is an experimentalist primarily. Brandon, I know you're doing really high quality state of the art measurements. How far do you think are we from really having trustful models uh, in the case of, of COVID-19 transmission in, in buildings, in indoor environments? I'm not exactly sure. I think uh, Professor Chen may be a better person to answer that. I, I think the model I showed, kind of the simplified material balance modeling, I think is rather straightforward, but it does work on the assumption that air is well mixed. So I think um, that's something that's, you know, as we can see is not true. And I think Professor Chen is, is the expert on looking at the spatial dispersion of these viral aerosols. Um, and, you know, I think based on his work, some of the models are, are quite reliable and um, can really inform building design. Um, I'm imagine, asking you as an experimentalist <laughs> <laughs> to criticize the models. <laughs> No, to create I, I a little bit of, uh, to generate some heat uh, in the panel. Uh, of course, uh, I know Professor Chen's work and I truly respect it. Well, um, I, I would say that this is a great question. You know, now people do use uh, advanced models like a CFD to do a lot of simulations and the result is so beautiful, right? We often call this a color through mechanics. So it's so appearing. And then the computer gives you a the accuracy like a seven or eight digit uh, behind the decimal point. Now, uh, I've been doing CFD for more or less my entire career, but I, uh, to be honest, I don't really trust the CFD result unless I can validate that. So in Ashray uh, handbook, um, that's a uh, indoor environment modeling. That's a very good uh, guideline. Tell you how you could really um, develop. Um, I mean, how, how could really use uh, the CFD or other type of models to predict a good result, and then you validate yourself. Because um, often I also heard that oh, I use a very good commercial uh, software. They using everywhere, and therefore my result is good. No. Just like you buy a car, right? You, you, you can just uh, turn these knobs on, that knobs off. You can have a very different uh, air conditioning systems uh, in your car. It gets the same. You know, when you use CFD, you can just change a lot of different parameters, you get a different result. And therefore, I like, you know, like Brandon's approach. You do a number of uh, the experimental measurement to validate your CFD. And then you continue to use the CFD to do the prediction. That will give you a reasonably good result. Thank you. Yeah, Thank I think you, this is yeah. really challenging yeah. us as an engineers because in a normal world, what we do is we'd, we'd put 10 people in a room, know where the sick person is and see who gets sick, right? That, that's the way engineers would work. You can't exactly do that with, with viruses, right? So, so, so um, I mean, we can't run experiments where we infect people, right? That, that's, that, that's why I asked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so, so we have to, to rely on kind of stitching together smaller scale experiments um, to kind of create what we think is the best knowledge, right? So, so 
we work with the, the Wells Riley analysis, you work backwards from field examples of where people have gotten sick, right? Then there's the laboratory studies where we're measuring particle sizes. And then, you know, even questions about are the virus particles evenly distributed in those different particle sizes? Do, do you have, um, are, are, is there more virus in the bigger particles versus the smaller particles, right? And then questions about how much does it take to get sick? Is it just one virus or does it take a certain critical mass? Those are all questions that individuals are working on and we're trying our best to stitch it together because we can't just experiment on people. Um, let, let, let's correct. I mean, John made a very good argument on the how experiment should be conducted. And I believe there's a lot of room for us and public health scientists to work together. Because uh, for engineers, we can calculate the, the uh, virus concentration, then you look at the exposure time, and then your inhaled rate, so you can get the number of uh, the, say, um, saliva with uh, the um, virus there. But the public health uh, scientists, they really did a very uh, detailed study. And of course, for them, they consider a little bit different. They also have to consider the uncertainties, how good your immune system, et cetera. So they will give you a range of how many the virus you inhale, then probably you will get sick. So by working with them, I think we can get a, a pretty good result without really use, using the uh, hum, actual human being to do the, any measurement. I think this type of a measurement is almost impossible to get the IRB approval. Yes, that, that's true, uh, which is difficult anyway. And it reminds me what my professor used to say that the people who do research in buildings uh, have the tough job. They do the real things, right? We're doing full scale, real people, real environments. It's not in a lab, something tiny like this that we're going to mimic. Uh, anyway, there are numerous questions regarding to the safety models and boundary conditions that I'm going to um, uh, to. Uh, skip for now, we'll come back to them if time allows, because I want to talk about um, the future. There are many questions also related to that. Um, what do we expect in general? Do we think that the future design of buildings would include, for example, um, virus transmission as a parameter, as it does for a fire or a earthquake. Uh, how do you see, John, for example, first, the industry moving forward? Yeah, that, that's a tough one. Um, I think we're going to, um, you know, definitely have the idea of infection control in the design of the buildings. Um, the, the, the challenges we've been thinking about it is, is, is just talking about Dr. Chin's work on airflow modeling and deciding how you design your duct work. You really need to know where the people are. And because and, the people are essentially um, the, the sources of the, of the contaminants. And, and unfortunately, people move around on you, which makes designing a building kind of tough. Um, so so that, that's something that, that you've got to think about is, is, is can we, maybe the better answer is can we design buildings in a way that they're robust and that they're, um, you know, can do the best they can given people can be anywhere um, in that building. And, all, you know, furniture moves around too, right? So you can design it for, a certain furniture arrangement, and then and then somebody else comes in and rearranges the furniture. So it's it's a real challenge. Yes, it is uh, even more challenging, more heterogeneity and variation. And and there is a question um, I would like uh, Professor Banfleth to try to answer. Uh, do you expect a new standard to come that would be focused on on virus mitigation of buildings? Um, since you are heavily involved in these activities. Well, well, certainly we expect standards to change. I, I don't know if creating a new infection control standard would be the right way to do that. You know, after 9-11 and the anthrax mailings, we created a, a guideline on protecting building occupants from, from bioterrorist incidents, and they probably are still on the original printing of that standard. I think we need to put those sorts of requirements into minimum standards like 62.1 and 62.2 in an appropriate way. And, and I don't know exactly how that will happen, but I, I think uh, there's pressure already to raise minimum standards from the point of view of, of uh, wellness, healthy building ideas. And, and now we have what's essentially an aspect of resilience being uh, put into the mix too. 
So uh, I, I expect significant changes over a period of time that may involve higher filtration requirements, the ability to uh, adapt to emergencies that isn't currently in the minimum standards, um, and, and perhaps encouragement of other uh, uses of technology. But, uh, it's going to take a while for that to happen because of the consensus process and because these things wind up being laws. Okay, thank you. A more specific question related to future design of buildings. I like it as an example. For example, how do we select air handlers? Should we design select them to full, full performance requirements using 100% outside air for pandemic usage? Um, if so, can that same air handler be designed to be easily converted or adjusted to perform um, for non-pandemic use? Uh, do you see these questions, John, in, in the industry uh, popping up already? So we're starting there. I mean, and it, and it all depends on you know your tolerance for risk. I mean, as you invest more in your air handler for a, for a kind of a a potential outcome in the future, right? It costs more upfront in your building. So the, 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 it's really a, a customer question, but things that I think are, are low standards are making sure that you design your air handler to have the space for a deeper filter. Um, that's relatively inexpensive to add. You don't have to put the filter in, but at least you have the space. Um, you know, making sure that you have, um, in, increase your duct sizing. It, it, it enables you to have more airflow, which gets you more air to the space. So there's some things that are lower cost things that they're, relatively inexpensive to put in when you're building the building um, that that are, are easy hitters. Well, I think that the filter issue is the easy one. That, that's the low hanging fruit. And I, I think everyone who's building a new building should be putting a MERV 13 filter or better in it anyway. MERV 13 is now the standard in California in Title 24. And I put in four inch wraps so you could get real MERV 13s. The, the original question though is, should I design the system for 100% outside air? Uh, that really means those systems will handle 100% outside air now if they have, have uh, economizer mode. What you're really asking is, should I size my heating and cooling coils for five times the outside air on a design day? And I'd say no. I, I, that, that's why we should be looking at, at air cleaners and filtration as a way of getting to these targets using the equivalent air exchange approach that you were talking about, John. Thank you, Bill. Uh, follow -up. Again, a lot of debate uh, here in the Q&A and chat about filters. Many people claim, like one person is claiming that the, um, a lot of the exhaust really um, gets into the ducts rather than the filter. Uh, so the, there is debate how effective the filter will be if um, um, if the virus actually will be getting to the Acts of the equipment rather than the filter. What your thoughts are on this? Um, Brandon, you, I know you have done very significant filtration projects for uh, ASHRAE. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I'd just like to add on to the, the previous question regarding uh, filtration and I think the future of buildings and so forth. So I think there's a lot of added benefits to using higher efficiency filters. Um, you know, wildfires were noted, wildfire smoke, and of course, just fine and ultra fine particles that are generated indoors from cooking, indoor combustion sources, and so forth. So I think that, you know, working towards uh, better filters in buildings makes a lot of sense for other reasons beyond just control of, of virus transmission. So um, in regard to Will the particles reach the filter? Well, I think there we have to look at the deposition mechanism. So once the particles are released from these respiratory activities, then there's a number of fates that they'll ultimately have. And we can model that. You know, some particles that are larger will settle out the air faster. Others will remain in the air for longer periods of time. They may, you know, deposit onto vertical surfaces and so forth. And then once they get into the HVAC system, yes, they can deposit onto the ductwork. And if you ever you know, look into the ducts in your house, uh, they can be quite dusty because particles deposit and accumulate over time. That's why we have things like duct cleaning. So yes, there could be deposition of particles that contain the virus in the duct work. And if that's upstream of the filter, you know, that stuff's not being filtered out at all and, and, and could be something that needs to be looked into. Um, but that, that can all be modeled and, and, and accounted for. 
Thank you very much, Brandon. Um, there is another question related to future design of buildings, or not exactly design, but future thinking. Uh, for example, for general public familiar with air quality index, there is zero to 500, less than 100 is safe. Um, how close are we to a similar metric for COVID related IAQ? Well, ASHRAE has in what's called an indoor air quality procedure in, in standard 62.1, and it uh, you know doesn't include microbials at all. It's it's uh, uh, organic chemicals and uh, oxidants like like ozone and PM. Nobody's come up with a a metric yet that, that really addresses microorganisms because you got the ambient ones that are there and maybe allergens, but then you've got these pathogens have come along now and then, and we have no idea how much of it we can be exposed to without risking a, a serious infection. So I, I think we're pretty far from a, a universal IAQ metric myself. Um, great, thank you, Bill. Um, uh, there are many detailed questions related to, to modeling and, and, and assumptions. Um, if I don't get a chance to ask all the questions posted in the chat and q and I would encourage our participants to email Professor Chen or Dr. Uh, Professor Banfleth, John and, and Brandon. Uh, we will have this uh, recording uh, publicly available uh, and you can um, watch it and you can also email our participants. Their emails are public anyway, mostly. Uh, John, I'm not sure about yours uh, and ask, uh, but uh, another question here that people ask, it's not very technical, I want to make it a bit lighter. Is it safe to fly? <laughs> I know um, Professor Chen uh, traveled yeah. recently, so maybe- I can. like to jump into this equation. You know, in the, past, in the past few months, a lot of media interviewed me and always asking me, is that safe to fly? And it really depends on how you protect yourself. You know, the fly is not only in the cabin. You have a ground transportation, you have a, uh, the spend time in the terminal, then of course in the cabin, et cetera. So I, I think in general, you know, so far there's very few passengers there. I don't think it's a problem. Uh, airliners uh, definitely take a very good measures. And for example, like a boarding the plane procedure, then the uh, seat arrangement, et cetera. And they also do the uh, disinfection reasonably well. So if I wanted to fly, I will take the first fly in the morning because uh, it, overnight they were killing it very well. But in the afternoon or overnight, uh, in the last flight, probably they don't clean that very well. So you have to do a little bit of disinfection yourself by using wipes, uh, to, especially wipe those uh, uh, many people will touch like um, armrest, uh, tray tables, etc. So according to the International Association of Transport, uh, International uh, Aviation Transport Association, they have a trace about 150,000 passengers and they only find two cases of transmission. So the risk mm -hmm. is pretty low. And the D uh, DOD study also somehow confirmed that the chance of getting infection is like 99, no, the uh, yeah, 0 0.03 percent. So let, let's leave the risk now. Thank you. Uh, another question that is uh, good um, uh, for uh, sort of um, summarizing. Um, epidemiologists make predictions. They are all over the media these days. Um, I th the people think on, on this um, uh, webinar that us engineers should work more closely with epidemiologists. Um, what do you think? How far or how close are we um, in, in doing this? Um, Bill, maybe you'll take a first pass? Uh, uh, sure. Well, you know, I think we should work more closely. We've, we've mostly been, you know, arguing with each other about airborne transmission because the engineers don't understand uh, uh, in infection mechanisms and the epidemiologists don't understand aerosol science. So, you know, I, I think there's a need to, to have communication that bridges uh, the gap there. And I'd, I'd like to see 
more of that in the future. That's certainly something we're trying to do within ASHRAE is to, to uh, bring in bring that people. kind that of expertise. That would be awesome. Yeah, um, we're John, not going to get a storage you... solution if we don't do that. I think so, John. Do you have an epidemiologist in your task force group? <laughs> no, we don't. We should. I mean, so, so I mean, I think that for, for at least for us at our company, right? It's a new thing, right? So, so for for the, most of us in the HVAC industry, thinking about we've, we're used to thinking about IEQ and, and general indoor air quality, but specifically you know, mitigating the risk of a specific virus is new, and we're all learning, and and we're trying to grab as much data as we can and and put it together. And help our customers make decisions based on it, right? So, we're, I mean, it's a learning process and, and um, you know, and we just keep, keep learning as we go. Great. And Professor Chen, I'm curious, have you, uh, a lot of models we see on, on uh, the TV every day, I've seen a lot of your work in New York Times and other journals, etc. cetera. Um, have you been approached by, by this uh, uh, system of system modelers, epidemiologists um, to include some of your work in their models? Uh, because I do think that these models would be wrong inside buildings right and and we do need to include our uh, uh, expertise um, there in something more sophisticated and integrated um, what do you think yeah i think it's very important in the past we did the work with the epidemiology system on the uh, SARS transmission as one and on uh, influenza and we find it's very beneficial and although it's a little bit uh, difficult to work in the beginning because we use a very different terminologies, you know, just to learn those terminologies uh, consume us a lot of time. But uh, you know, especially like in the airplane type of study, you can see airliners really, you know, get the different type of people working together. Also medical doctors, terminologists, uh, the engineers, and also the uh, policy um, Makers. So let, let's, I, I think to solve this COVID-19 COVID crisis, we need really to have a multi uh, and interdisciplinary team to work together. Um, I agree. Um, I, I think it's a really complex problem and it would require some different way of thinking. We, there are a lot of good ideas that have been already discussed in this webinar. Um, and uh, I really hope that uh, we can uh, somehow engage uh, practically in the design of, of resilient buildings in collaboration with doctors and epidemiologists and, and other um, disciplines because um, it, it hasn't happened so far. Um, in the past, the way we design buildings, we have, of course, our own standards and, uh, and codes, but we do take some inputs from other disciplines um, as inputs. There is not really a lot of back and forth and, and iteration and integration. Um, so let's uh, hope that this will happen this time to, to, uh, to make uh, buildings more safe and efficient as well. Um, as we move into the future, sustainability is also another big target and, and occupant well-being um, that we need um, to consider. Um, as uh, I, I think we have passed the time, um, we do have plenty of questions that we weren't able um, to answer. Um, we can keep going. Uh, I'm not uh, sure if we're supposed to do that. Uh, Stephanie and Arvin, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, you know, this is, this is uh, what we might do is also an opportunity to uh, have <clears throat> The Q&As can also be answered post and be posted actually uh, on the website as well. So if you run out of time, uh, but it's to your discretion if you want to take a few minutes to wrap this up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so maybe we'll uh, take a few more um, uh, questions. Um, uh, Dr. Chen, there was a question about your plume. It's going up from the head. Uh, the not the plume i apologize the um the particles travel over the head is there a thermal plume there yes yeah it is because um uh, lattice uh, animation was done 
on a uh, just a still air with the 24 degree C uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And then the body surface temperature, I believe was a 30 or 31 degree C. So you do get the thermal plume in, induced by your body. And therefore when you cough, then the warm air will go up and therefore go a little bit to the higher level. Okay, and, and people are asking if you have a, a, a particle tracking in, in your models? Yes, we do have a particle tracking in the model. You, you can really tra just track every particle if you use Lagrangian model. And that, but of course, the computing cost is a little bit higher. And, and some other design related questions. If you could comment, uh, I think for Professor Banfleth on a proposal to operate lab, a laboratory building with fume hoods with a hood chassis open to increase ventilation. Um, what are your thoughts uh, there? Yeah, well, I mean, if it's uh, a, a hood dominated laboratory, um, it, it could be troublesome for air balance if you open up the sashes, not to mention it's going to burn a huge amount of energy. And some of the lab people I've talked to have been concerned that if the, if the hoods are, to, are dictating the, the flow patterns in, in the space, then you could get uh, horizontal air currents that could uh, actually increase risk for some, and you'd have the highest concentrations of contaminants near the, the hoods themselves. So I, I think the lab people that, I've, that we've talked with have been a little bit skeptical of, of that approach. They don't really want to mess around with their air balance very much, and air cleaners might actually be a, a better strategy. Maybe John has dealt with owners and has other things to add to that. I think, yeah, I mean, the hoods are there for a very specific purpose, which is to, to maintain a, a face block in the hood to keep the, the chemicals in the hood. And um, it's actually a pretty expensive thing to operate. I mean, there's a quite a bit of airflow going through those hoods. So leaving them open all the time would be really, really expensive um, from an energy perspective. The reason why they you have, have a make up here. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, it's, I mean, they're designed to do it, right? The, the systems are designed to, to have the makeup air, but it's a lot of makeup air and it's really expensive. So, so, um, what we're finding, and it kind of gets back to the original idea, is that, you know, filtration, right, a, a HEPA filter, a MERV-13 filter that's recirculating within the room does a pretty darn good job of removing particles from the air. And that is a much more cost effective than diluting the particles with fresh air from outside. Um, so if you're going to do something, you know, an in-room filtration unit is probably a more cost effective way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, and another question um, um, that is interesting, uh, Jan, so I will uh, ask, uh, how accurately you think you can uh, model the coughing and what velocities do you assume? So since we talked about models and, and how um, we can trust them to, to make um, decisions. Yeah, actually the uh, coughing model we use is not a numerical model. We really have a uh, good number of students and we ask them to do uh, coughing, real coughing. And we have a very good equipment to measure that. But of course, it, I mean, the model, the, the, the flow rate, the uh, velocity varies a great deal. So we use the average value for the model in the CFD simulation. All right, great. And um, and with regards to um, how we move forward, I would like to um, to make maybe some um, um, uh, take some comments from our panelists. Um, I think um, uh, the world has responded to this pandemic um, really fast, and I'm surprised to see all these solutions that we have uh, for building design installation filters and etc. So, and we have it looks like we have already um, thought um, about some. Uh, quick fixes and, and things to do, but uh, I would like us to think um, a little bit more deep into the future. What do you think we should change in the way we design or operate buildings to really make them more um, resilient and also sustainable and um, promote well-being? Um, any thoughts that you would like to, to share and as a closing remark? Um, for this uh, webinar, Bill, I see you smiling. So oh, you ha must have some good solutions. That's just because I'm a happy person. I'll, I'll be happy <laughs> to, to, to start off. Uh, 
Uh, sure. You know, I think that's the important thing. And I, I just touched on it earlier was that we were yes, really trying to bring did. together resilience and, and sustainability and uh, healthy buildings all at the same time. And, and so um, some of the things that we might need to do uh, are going to add mm -hmm. energy cost if we do them in the same way that we design buildings now. So one of the things I see being important in the future is sensor development and demand control being applied much more granularly than it is now. So not just on the scale of the whole building, but really where the person is and, and trying to, to really deliver high quality indoor environment when there's somebody there to benefit from it and not conditioning uh, huge amounts of, of space in buildings that uh, where, where all of that cost is wasted. So uh, and, you know, the other thing is I think uh, not huge increases in ventilation rate, but uh, trying to really crack the problem of how do we use air cleaners for all the different types of contaminants to uh, limit our, our outdoor air to uh, something that's not going to have a, a really negative energy impact. Great, thank you. Um, Brandon, um, I know you have been working on, uh, in addition to your uh, uh, chemistry and physics of droplet size, also on some low cost sensors for um, massive um, integration in, in environments, indoor and outdoor. Uh, do you think that um, some of these ideas that you have explored could be also beneficial uh, in, in future buildings to be more resilient with regards to um, virus transmission? Uh, yes, I believe so. So I think we now have a lot of low cost sensor technology available and integrating them into building design and operation makes a lot of sense. I think that kind of, as Bill pointed to, um, you know, these sensors can be used for improved occupancy detection. I mean, carbon dioxide is one thing, but we could be measuring other things as well. Uh, of course, and fine particles would be, I think, an obvious thing to add on to kind of a you know, an air handler uh, and um, building, you know, management system. And I think a lot of these low cost sensors are quite promising, but they need to be carefully evaluated. Some of them are not very accurate. We talked a lot about these submicron particles, especially that are produced in the respiratory activities. A lot of these lower cost optical particle sensors that people are starting to use on kind of a larger scale are not so sensitive to these smaller particles. So I think that, you know, using sensors that are carefully calibrated and, and various strategies to improve their robustness would be important. Um, but I think that just kind of general monitoring of a variety of air pollutants would be better than just CO2 tracking, which has been the most conventional thing that we've been doing. So particles and volatile organic compounds, ozone and a number of other, um, species would be, I think, good just in general. Thank you very much. And I think you could be a key person since you have this high quality equipment and also low cost sensor passion to sort of calibrate the sensors and develop this new technology. I think I would uh, suggest uh, uh, the future also be more CFD modeling into the integration of uh, virus uh, transmission and also integration of, uh, um, uh, you know, how we respond to the pandemic. Uh, Professor Chen, how far do you think are we from this or, or how do you see this happening? Yeah, well, thank you very much. I, I think the CFD is just a tool. But I think the future buildings need to be designed in such a way we don't have to really find this quick fix like what we do now. Exactly. Because the disease will come and go every uh, a few years. You know, just look in the past 20 years, we have a SARS in 2003, uh, H1N1 influenza in the 2009, and now the 2020, right? I, mean, I don't know what happens in the next next uh, next decade. And uh, to solve this type of problems, we really needed to work together with the architects, the uh, health scientists. Uh, just take natural ventilation as an example. We found that it's a very uh, cost-effective way uh, to ventilate the building and lower the uh, virus concentration inside the buildings. But you look at the Purdue, which building you could open the window? Well, at least the no buildings are being, <laughs> there's no possibilities to open the window. So this type of thinking, you know, we needed to change. 
Uh, let's also have a huge impact on the energy, right? On our mentality, because the human behavior also will change a lot. If you could operate the window, you uh, occupant will be happier. So that, that type of thing, I think we need to uh, work together as a team. So no matter which area you are from, so then we can make the future building more resilient. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. I know, John, you already touched upon this in your talk. If there is anything that you would like to add, please uh, go yeah, yeah. for it. I, I think the, the, the idea to think about is in light of COVID, we're asking more of our buildings, right? Prior to COVID, we standard into our quality metrics. 62.1 is a good example of that. I think most of our customers, in order to mitigate the risk of COVID, they're doing things above and beyond 62.1. And so that's probably going to consume more energy. But at the same time, those customers also are coming to us and saying, um, we've, we've made carbon reduction commitments to, to, our, to our investors and to our, to our customers. And how do we do this additional work of mitigating infection risk in our buildings while still maintaining our, our commitments to reduce our carbon footprint? So I think there's gonna be a lot of work, not necessarily, there's gonna be some work directly related to buildings, right, in infection risk reduction, but also additional work in making buildings generally more efficient to make up for the additional energy associated with this new task that we've asked the building to do, right? Which is was protect us from getting sick. So, so I think there's gonna be even more work in, in making the buildings efficient. Great, uh, thank you. In summary, we have even more work to do. So I would like to close this panel. We are already uh, over time, but there were a lot of interesting questions and many that we didn't have time to uh, answer today. So I would like to take this opportunity to warmly thank once again, our excellent panelists. I appreciate you for your time. I know you're all very busy doing um, many things this semester. I would like to thank our participants and of course, Arvin for the opportunity to organize this seminar and uh, showcase the importance of buildings um, in, in the case of, of virus transmission and also demonstrate our passion uh, about uh, buildings uh, and providing solutions. So with, with that, I would like to close this session and um, um, uh, thank again, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you. Enjoy the rest great. of your day. Bye.